Hello, everyone, and inside today's Locked On Canadians, it's all chaos in Game 82. Your Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 1051 of Locked on Canadians. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Right now, make every moment more because new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. I am one of your hosts. I am, of course, Scott Malas, joined, as always, by the active stick, Laura Saba. And we have potentially the most fun chaotic, insane loss of the season for the Montreal Canadiens in one that doesn't really leave either of us like totally upset because of how things played out. But uh, a lot happened for a Monday night. The Canadians aren't usually a Monday night hockey team. And boy, was Monday night in Detroit absolutely bonkers. Canadians lose 5-4 in overtime. Lucas Raymond scores with the extra attacker and in overtime Keeps Detroit alive because the Montreal Canadiens are of nothing uh, but good, not good hosts, but good sportsmen, giving Detroit a lifeline, hopefully to just come in tomorrow and beat them 7 nothing and end everything immediately. <laughs> I am only coping a little bit when I say that. Laura, how are you feeling after, after that game? Well, the thing is, Detroit is fighting for their playoff lives, right? They've got a lot to fight for, not just because they're so close to a playoff spot, but this was a big year for them in which they made a lot of acquisitions in the offseason where they need to have something to show for it, right? So you knew that no matter what happened, they weren't going down without a fight and that it was going to be really, really tough. Um, I was focused very much on Lane Hudson, which I know we'll talk about him in the second period, but I did think the Montreal Canadiens could have held uh, better control of that game. Uh, I do think they could have uh, shut Detroit out. I do think they could have really played spoiler, but as it is, nothing is settled and tomorrow is going to be extremely consequential. Yeah, I'm, I'm bringing up natural stat trick now. This was a game where Detroit just basically put it on the Canadians and the Canadians just kind of weathered the storm and used their opportunities to strike at Detroit. And they did a pretty good job at that. Detroit's goaltending tonight was not good. I know Montembeau's on the hook for five goals, but if you look at both goalies in this game and tell me that Alex Lyon was better, I'm going to say your head was shoved up your ass. But this is a game where Detroit, when the chips got down, did everything that you want to see from a team that is desperately trying to get back into to try and keep their playoff hopes alive. They went down 4-1, and that could have been, that's it, we're done. Fans were throwing their last octopi of the year on the ice there, and then they scored 33 seconds later. It's 4-2, and the Canadians just kind of weathered the storm. They didn't come out with the thir- in the third period to play offensive hockey. They came out to grind down the clock, and everything on the stat chart shows that. More high danger chances for Detroit, more scoring chances, more shots for five on five, better Corsi numbers. The expected goals at five on five admittedly ended up better for the Canadians at 1.79 uh, to 1.71. In all situations, 3.13 to Detroit, 1.96 for Montreal. Detroit had the only power play of the game, which feels wild to say because this was a game that was officiated exactly like how I would expect a playoff game to be officiated. And this is about as close as you could get to a playoff game without being in the playoffs. Uh, I want to be upset. So high. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you, you were about <laughs> to say you want to be upset. Like, I want to be upset. Like, blowing a 4-1 lead sucks. But this is a team on literally their last legs. And as Canadians fans, we saw them do this against Toronto in the playoffs. Down 3-1, backs against the wall in the playoffs. And come out, maybe not win pretty, but they still won. And those things are important. It is undeniable that um, Little Caesars Arena was rocking at that game. That unmatched atmosphere. And the thing is, the Canadians didn't look perfect in this. You know, there were some bumps in the road. We're going to talk about Lane Hudson stuff to the side there. Defensively, 
offensively, I thought they made the best of their opportunities. They had a bunch of chances and just missed potentially putting it out of reach just a little bit. Brendan Gallagher, two goal night, one coming off a great assist from Lane Hudson, his first career NHL point. Another one off a weird bounce where it hit Jake Evans on a clear bounced right to him in the slot. Love that. Rafael Harvey Pinard gets in on that. Uh, Justin Barron with the goal of the night for the Canadians, <laughs> not the Red Wings. The Red Wings. That's its own thing, but he gloves it down, drops it, and then basically rips it like a golf shot top corner. I was impressed with what the offense looked like, but this was clearly a team trying to not lose. And Detroit, when they got blood in the water, they they absolutely took it. The Canadians had like 30 blocked shots by the end of the game here. And that's just because Detroit was causing them fits. And we'll probably see some lineup shuffling tomorrow going into Montreal. Jaden Struble was out tonight. Uh, Caden Gooley was working it in practice. I assume maybe he plays tomorrow. I don't know. Uh, but all I know is, and we'll get to this at the end of the show, game 82 has everything to play for in here. But out of everything in this game, I'm going to choose to not look so much at the Canadians blowing what they did, but taking a look at some of the positives. Brendan Gallagher's 15 goals on the season. Jake Evans topped 20 assists. Justin Perrin scored again. Josh Anderson got an assist on it. It's hard to be too broken up when... Canadians fans wanted to lose this game anyways. And then they did to a team that needed to win this completely. Um, right. Like to Detroit, we always knew Detroit needed to win out, but also Detroit is a team that the Canadians should be capable of beating on a good night. Right. And that's why it's a little, it's, it's not confusing at all, actually. Like, it's just that tonight, like, I feel like the Canadians were just like, a hair away from dominating, a hair away from winning. Like there are just like little things that I would have wanted to do differently, like tiny little things that overall would have added to a better result. But also at the same time, as you pointed out, fans want to be losing at this stage in the game. There's not that much to play for. They want to be losing for a higher draft pick. I just felt like there was just like, there was just like that extra edge that we did not see that we wanted to see, or that would have caused the Canadians to win this game. But at the same time, when we were talking about the Habs playing spoiler for the rest of the season about a week and a half ago, I think one of the things that we both agreed is that we would rather Detroit make the playoffs over any of those other bozos. So I think, you know, like part of it is not too terrible. And also we do love Brian and Scotty over at Locked On Red Wings. Check them out for sure, uh, because they are truly delightful people that we love and respect. But at the same time, you know, like we wanted to see this because it would have been fun. You know, Detroit being back in the playoffs after uh, some really abysmal seasons of hockey, I think uh, for me would have been, it would have been fun to see. It would have been exciting to see. It would have been fun to see like some of these young players make a lot of noise too. Um, and that would have been the hope, right? Like they've been playing like this through the stretch of the season. So if they do make the playoffs, like they would give their opponents a run for their money. I think they are locked into playing the uh, Leafs, right? If they do make the playoffs. I believe uh, Toronto either, pl I want to say is, Hold on here. Where is the playoff format here? Sorry, I know. Show me what the bracket looks like. The NHL is useless because I want it to show me what the bracket will look like, and it just cannot do that for me because it is no. absolutely useless. Uh, NHL playoff picture. Let's see here. I took us off on a different tangent. I'm sorry. No, I, this, I, this I is fine curious. because it would be fine if anything just had, here's the bracket. Anyways, we'll go into that <laughs> after tomorrow's done and over with. Uh, but the only uh, New York, the Rangers have clinched the uh, president's trophy and the Islanders clinched tonight. Basically tomorrow is all to play for, for the Red Wings. They have to win in regulation to give themselves that buffer. Cause if I am looking at the NHL.com standings correctly here, uh, the Penguins can only hit 90 points. The Flyers uh, can only hit 89 points. Uh, and the Capitals can hit 91 points. So Detroit has to win uh, and Washington has to lose. Uh, I believe Detroit is the tiebreaker based on regulation wins right now. Oh, but oh, no. Uh, Washington has more regulation wins. So never mind. Detroit needs to win in regulation tomorrow or get two points. Uh, the Canadians are basically locked into a top six or seven pick at this point anyways the key part of that game and what we were all very 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 excited about 
It was the debut of none other than 2023 62nd overall draft pick. The smallest of defensemen, small in stature, big and hard. Lane Hudson made his NHL debut for the Montreal Canadiens. We're going to break down the good, the bumps in the road, and more coming up next. But first, as we set off the top of the show, today's episode is brought to you by the folks at FanDuel. And it is playoff time for the NBA and the NHL. Baseball season is in full swing. Better luck to the Red Sox and our fans next year. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks. Is Tyler O'Neill going to keep hitting dingers for the Red Sox? I certainly hope so. It's the only thing keeping me sane watching baseball. Going into the playoffs, is Toronto going to choke in the first round? Can Matthews keep this pace up? You can find all of that on FanDuel. because. I want to know, what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn today and make your first bet an automatic win with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And as always, we do want to remind you to please bet responsibly anytime that you play. And if you're a football fan like myself, Lockdown NFL's mock draft goes live on April 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern on the Lockdown Sports Day 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app. Find the full six-episode series on April 17th at 7 p.m. from all of our local experts. Well, speaking of local experts, Laura lives in Montreal, and I live in the United States, so I think that perfectly qualifies us to talk about Lane Hudson, who played hockey in the United States and now plays for the Montreal Canadiens in the NHL. As you will recall, he was picked 62nd overall by the Montreal Canadiens because he was short. (laughs) <laughs> and a Sabres fan, out of everyone in my mentions uh, tonight, the only people who weren't annoying were Sabres fans who went, well, it would have been really great if the Buffalo Sabres drafted him. And I have to say, it's been a really tough year here in Buffalo for a lot of folks. Uh, anyways, we want to break down Lane Hudson's NHL debut. And to be objective about this, not flawless, but the Canadians didn't play a flawless game. I thought Hudson did what we kind of expected from him. He played some of the hits. There is going to be the adjustment period for this, but you can see everything that is clicking uh, behind his eyes there. He sees the game at a level. I don't think a lot of Canadians defensemen or even forwards do. Uh, And I guess we'll start with the good here. His first NHL point is he is working along the blue line. He gets (laughs) a return feed from David Savard. He is skirting the line about as close as you can get. And then he kind of dips his shoulder a little bit and cuts right around the edge. Gets a little bit of a screen pick, which I believe it was um, either Sebastian High or David St. Louis who pointed out that as players on the Canadians adjust to his intricacies in his game, you're going to see them get in better position to give him that space to operate. He cuts towards the net, puts a, a shot right at the net there, bounces around. Brendan Gallagher gets a stick on it. Swats it in. It's a one nothing game. He gets the primary assist, and it's not quite Ryan Palin getting a hat trick in his first debut or anything like that, but that's the kind of play that I want to see from Lane Hudson. He, he was aggressive, under control, and he's using his agility to find lanes in the offensive zone. And just seeing that, that he has the confidence to do that in his first game. First shift, maybe caught a little bit flat-footed, gives up a shot to Lucas Raymond. Next shift comes out and does that. That's a gamer. That's a battler. That's someone that I want to see on, you know, playing more and more. I wish the Canadians would have had a chance to draw a power play tonight. I would have liked to have seen him in that space to see what he can do, but... There's always tomorrow night. (laughs) Oh, now we've jinxed it. There'll be no Canadians power plays again, which is a rant for another episode for the back half of the season. Not going to do that tonight because it's not important. But in terms of making an impact right away, I I absolutely adore that. Like, that is the Lane Hudson I want to see. I know there's going to be defensive miscues, but that is what I want to see from him. Well, that's the thing. So one of the things that I noticed throughout the game was that he didn't lose his head. He did make errors, and those are the things, like, you, you, you know, you call them miscues. I think that's a great way to describe it. Um, before you finish, before, before you say why you just look like that right now, um, he did not look 
nervous. He looked he looked like somebody who needs to adjust, but he did not look scared or nervous. He didn't lose his mind. He looked to me like he had confidence and poise and ideas, and he just didn't look out of place. Like it it just looks like he's going to have to learn and have growing pains. Scott, it looks like you're about to say something really, really surprising or outrageous. If you're going to tell me that his expected goals, whatever, was like 1%, I'm going to cry. I'm not even looking at the stats. The Canadians have recalled defenseman Logan Mayu from the Laval Rocket for the last game of the season. What? I have a feeling they're playing all the kids tomorrow night that I imagine a lot of these vets are going to get a night off. They're giving him his one game as a reward for his really strong AHL season, which is probably fair. Uh, Wait, so Laval's not playing on Tuesday. They're they're playing on they're playing Thursday. Friday, Saturday this week. They're playing Friday, Saturday. Okay, because that's why I was like, I was shocked. I was like, I thought there was a game. I thought it's like a crucial week. Nope. Okay. Last week was the game on Thursday, and then again on Saturday, uh, okay. Friday, Saturday this week in Belleville. He gets his one game for being one of the best scoring defensemen in the AHL, one of the best rookies in the league this year. I. I don't know what the defense is going to look like now because Caden Gooley was back in practice. Uh, I imagine that after this game, Jaden Struble and Joshua and then also Mayu will be sent down uh, to Laval. They were papered down at the deadline and Mayu was already on the roster there. doesn't require waivers anyways. Uh, Jesus. Anyways, I don't know what the pairings are going to look like. Do not expect a lot of defense in tomorrow's game. Uh, this <laughs> I do is uh, some humor. Yeah, this this feels a lot like the Canadians. They might go 11-7 for all I know tomorrow night and just play a seventh defenseman for specialty situations. I don't know. We're going to see what that lineup looks like. I want to get back to everyone's going to look at that at the overtime winner for Lane Hudson in this where he made a great play. He cuts in, cuts to the center of the ice, gets a good shot off. The rebound bounces right to Detroit. He has to go from a stop then. Josh Anderson is covering back immediate red flag and Hudson is hustling to try and get back. Larkin's not a slow skater and Lucas Raymond's not exactly slow either. Hudson does his best to get back. Anderson is playing Larkin like he's going to play the shot the whole way, even though Hudson is maybe a half stent behind Raymond. Larkin gets the puck over there. People are going to talk about his speed and agility and everything else at the NHL level. And I think, what we're going to see is he's going to be one of those guys that Adam Nicholas and this training staff is going to work a lot with on getting that stride up to NHL speed. Because if you're going to be like Mike Matheson, you're making these daring runs and cuts into the offensive zone. You got to get back. Uh, David St. Louis pointed it out to me is that he's doing a lot of skating back to his assignment, skating forward. He is not back skating because maybe he doesn't have, that same stride power to get back and not get turnstiled on that. And that's something that can be worked on. Those are mechanical things. Those are not up in the head kind of things here. I, I'm not willing to be like, wow, he can't skate at all. No, I think he's a very fluid skater, but he's on his edges more than straight line speed. Like I look at Alex Newhook, straight line speed, fast, Josh Anderson, straight line speed, fast, I look at someone like Lane Hudson on his edges, very quick, agile, and fluid, but maybe doesn't generate that same power in a straight line, which is not the end of the world if he has a partner who is able to cover for him. David Savard, I thought, did all right in that spot. Josh Anderson is not going to be that guy. Sorry, Josh. All respect to you. You're not. You backskating as a defenseman, I would almost rather Montembeau just kind of face that on his own and see what <laughs> happens there, but... It, it's it's never going to be a good situation on that. Uh, I'm antis- I if they can't scratch Hudson with all of his friends coming to the game in Montreal tomorrow, that would be so cool. so unlike this Canadians team. Uh, I think he's going to get every opportunity again tomorrow. Maybe Matheson's the healthy scratch just to give him a night off because he's played I mean, he's every already, single you know, game. Yeah. yeah, he's played every single game. He's tired. He's already had you know, a phenomenal season, uh, like breaking records of like whatever most points since X, Y, Z. I think he's fine. I think he's fine to sit out. I, and that's thing is we'll see. I, 
<laughs> just uh, I I'm surprised they went with this um, with Gooley and everyone else. Unless maybe they're just not going to play Gooley and let him recuperate. Some of these other guys who maybe just need a game or two, uh, who are nursing stuff. It's the last game of the year. The Canadians don't really have. They have nothing to play for. Detroit has everything to play for, and if you can't beat the kids' team, you don't deserve to make the playoffs. Unfortunately, uh, truth Sounds of the matter. Fair. Getting into game eighty-two, chaos is what we're expecting. The Canadians control so much of what happens tomorrow and into Wednesday. They they are they hold the orb of chaos, as we're going to call it. And that being the last wild card spot, we're going to get into breaking down all of what can happen tomorrow. What we're cheering for coming up next. But first, as we said before, NHL playoffs are right around the corner. The NBA playoffs are in full swing. Baseball's in full swing. And regardless of where we know the Habs are finishing in the standings this year, we want you to win big by playing Daily Fantasy Hockey on Sleeper, the official Daily Fantasy app of Locked On NHL Network. Because you know what? You can win 100 times your money, and all you got to do is pick whether star players like McDavid, Sidney Crosby, Nathan McKinnon, Nikita Kucherov will record more or less than our sleeper projections for things like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, or more in a given game. And to win 100 times your bet, you need to predict the outcome of eight player stats. That's right. 100 times your money playing daily fantasy hockey with sleepers. So start paying attention and nail those picks so you can start winning big. Just use promo code locked on NHL and you'll get a hundred dollar match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code locked on NHL. See sleepers terms of use for details and locational availability. All right. Game 82. Uh, they haven't really meant anything to the Canadians in forever, basically, at this point. Uh, I, I can't remember the last time that the Canadians played a game 82 that mattered for absolutely anything at all. And I want to say it was probably 2023. Um, <laughs> or 20, Jesus. Oh my God. I mean, who you mean 21, um, when they went to the, when was the Stanley uh, cup run 2021, I guess it's that anyways, tomorrow, the Canadians play a meaningful game 82. It is just not meaningful for them. As we kind of ran down in the first segment here and let me bring up the standing. So I have these things pulled up side by side. Can I just say what the tiebreakers are really quick? Absolutely laid on me. Uh, so superior points per percentage, which at the end of the year, you're paying, you're all playing 82 games. So the greater number of games won, excluding games won in overtime by shootout. So regulation wins the greater number of games, excluding games won by shootout. So if you have overtime, like equal, uh, then if you won games more in more in overtime than in a shootout, then that also is goes in your favor. The greater number of games won by the club in any matter, uh, that one is the easiest one, greatest number of wins in the W column, the greater number of points earned in games against each other among two or more tied clubs. So there's five different tiebreakers. So the Flyers, and this is courtesy of our friend Armando Velez, they need to win in regulation to get over Washington. And then they would have to get all the way to the fifth tiebreaker to beat them, to jump them. And they also need a Wings regulation loss and a Penn's regulation loss against the New York Islanders on Wednesday. So the Flyers basically are screwed. Oh, no. How terrible. That's <laughs> awful. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, um, <laughs> I, I look at this and that. So I have the schedule pulled up for tomorrow. Uh, Montreal, Detroit is obviously holding all the pieces in place right now. Uh, if somehow Montreal wins in regulation, Detroit is stuck on 89 points and the flyers can win. If they beat Washington can move up to 89 points tomorrow as well. Washington is sitting on 89 points right now with 81 games played. Uh, and then what the funniest thing of all of this is that Pittsburgh plays the Islanders. The Islanders have nothing to play for at this point. They've they clinched play. their playoff spot. They are locked into a matchup with the Carolina hurricanes. And all they're going to do is just beat the ever-loving crap out of the Penguins because that's all they do when they play now. It's there, and that's it for. There's no other Eastern Conference matchups outside. Uh, Tampa and Toronto is seating related. Toronto, Florida is also seating related. But like those two games back to back, 7 p.m. tomorrow, Montreal and Detroit, Washington, Philadelphia 
control basically the fate of everything uh, right now. And I'm trying to think of the funniest possible outcome for everything here because no one from the Metro deserves to make it. And also the idea that we could crush someone's dreams at home with an all children lineup uh, in a season where we're going to be picking top five again is absolutely scrumptious to me. And yes, I'm saying scrumptious because I will bathe in the salt that comes from this. <laughs> I do. I want the penguins to make the, Laura, pick me, help me out here. What's the most chaotic thing that we can root for tomorrow? Is it the penguins making the playoffs somehow? No, I don't want the penguins making the playoffs. The most chaotic thing, honestly, would probably be the penguins, but also, honestly, no, the most chaotic thing would be if the flyers made the playoffs because a bunch of chaotic things have to happen in order for that to do it. And out of all of the teams, as much as I hate all of them, the Flyers are the ones that deserve it the least. Washington's got a minus 38 goal differential. I don't understand how they're going to make the playoffs. I truly don't get it. This but is a team that I know. thought was dead in the water. Same. And then again, the entire Metro has been dead in the water basically for a while now. The Flyers could have coasted in and they basically just bombed out of the division. Uh, it's going to be very funny when the New York Islanders beat the Carolina Hurricanes in round one. But in terms of chaotic things tomorrow, if I, and this is just, I need everything peaked in here, Detroit, Montreal, go to overtime, whatever Montreal wins in overtime. Detroit is stuck on 90 points. Washington loses to, you know, the flyers, the flyers come out and just absolutely blow the capitals out of the water. And then Detroit, and they think, okay, Montreal's got a whatever goal lead against the Red Wings heading into the final minute there. The Red Wings tie it like they did tonight, only tomorrow night. It is a Lane Hudson overtime winner, and you just get to crush the spirit of Flyers fans at once. Then on Wednesday, the Penguins needing a regulation win to have a chance against an Islanders team that is just playing F you, I don't care, playoff hockey, and has been since Patrick Watt got there, just coming out and playing the ugliest possible 3-1 win you've ever seen in your entire life. <laughs> that is what I want, because it breaks the hearts of the most possible people at once. <laughs> Whether the Penguins make it or not. If the Penguins make it, I, I really can't bet against Sidney Crosby just doing incredible things in the playoffs. All respect to him. I want Detroit to make it, but also the ability to just be spiteful and petty because that is who I am as a person sounds like so much fun. And then we wait for the draft lottery. And then when we don't win anything, everyone can point out to this is how it's probably bad, uh, bad karma or something like that, which yeah, probably fair. Uh, the Canadians are locked in at fifth right now. Arizona has 75 points as well uh, with one game left. And that one will be important for the Canadians to watch or Habs fans to watch. They are playing the Oilers in their last game as an Arizona, as an Arizona franchise. If you don't think they're going to come out and play with two fingers in the air and somehow win that game, I don't know what to tell you. They're either going to get blown out at home by the Oilers or they're going to somehow win that game with just double birds in the air. Uh, Otto, or the Oilers on... also can just rest people, right? Like that is their last game. They could do that. They might not. Um, I they think they have that. seating at stake in. Uh, no, the Oilers are basically locked into the second Pacific spot. They cannot catch. The Oilers have three games left. There's okay. I'm really confused how that happened. How the Do Oilers, they have a game tonight? Uh, yes, they are. I currently and sorry, JD, love you. Uh, beating the crap out of the Sharks for nothing. So then after this, they have two games. Oh my god. Yeah, the Western Conference for whatever reason isn't is ending the back half of this week. Uh, the Oilers play Arizona on Wednesday, and then they play Colorado to end the season on Thursday night. Fine. So. The Oilers can't actually rest anybody. They're still playing for something going into that game. I can't believe I'm going to stay up the day before I have to drive to Michigan to watch Edmonton, Arizona. What's wrong with me? Anyways, it's good. The next three days are just going to be pure chaos in the NHL. 
And don't worry, we will be back after the season ends, after the Rocket decide their fate this weekend as well. Remember, Wednesday, the Belleville Senators play Syracuse. You are, if you are a Rocket fan, cheering for Syracuse to beat Belleville by any means necessary. A win in regulation basically gives the Rocket the ability to win one more game in regulation and basically all but secure a spot going into the weekend. Laura will have guests. I am here tomorrow night for the last episode, and then I do have to travel for work, so I will be back after all the chaos ascends. Uh, trust me, follow me on Twitter, at Scott Matla, if you want all of my unhinged thoughts that I can't say on this show. You can follow Laura at The Active Stick. You can follow the show at LO underscore Canadians, uh, wherever you get your daily podcast, Google, Apple, Spotify, wherever. Man. Season's almost over. Game 82 is right around the corner. Uh, Once again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you all next time.